Hello, 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 everybody. Thank you for joining us again for yet another week of the Metal Blade Live series. I'm your host, Riley McShane, back again, singer for a legion, host of this whole fun thing. And I'm here today with another industry person. I know you guys know how excited I get about all this stuff. I swear we'll get some more like band guys back here. But in the meantime, I'm just, you know, loving loving all these interviews but uh, we have we have another industry person with us here today dan dismal of church of the eighth day how you doing man doing pretty good another another day another breath of fresh air good yeah, to be yeah. a- that's it's good things to be grateful for man I, uh, yeah definitely you know, so it's the little things like that, that keep you going and then you go from there so for the people who are uh, watching who are not as familiar as you with uh, I or some of our other viewers are, who who are you? And when, in the famous words of the kindergarten cop, who is your daddy and what does he do? Uh- <laughs> well, Papa was a rolling stone. That's about it. It was, it, was, it was the 70s. So he was a, I don't know what the hell he does except for inseminate my mom. Yeah. <laughs> My name is uh, Daniel Dismal. I'm a Los Angeles native, born and raised. Moved up to Bakersfield recently, but still Los Angeles. And um, most people know me for being a show promoter in the Los Angeles area. I've also done them in, you know, San Diego, uh, Orange County sometimes. I very rarely go down that way. That's a weird spot. Yeah. Sometimes the Bay Area as well, which I have a lot of respect for. Yeah. Uh, I used to, I still sing in a band. I played in many bands, but yeah, most people know me as, is Dan Dismal from Church of the Eighth Day. Oh yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Church of the Eighth Day. Like how did you, how did you start as a promoter? And I guess for those of, uh, those of them watching who aren't as familiar with playing shows or setting up shows, what exactly does a promoter do? Uh, it started out of, it's basically started because I was, My band, like I said, I was in a band. We ended up getting signed later on and touring and everything. But when we were in the local, you know, in the local scene in Los Angeles, to get on a show that was at a club, you had to, you know, sell tickets. And it was like, you know, I always thought like, why the hell am I selling tickets to play with Cannibal Corpse? Cannibal Corpse has their own draw. Like, so what I ended up doing was is taking my friends' bands, and then we start. I said, "Well, I'm going to start doing my own shows. Screw this." We started started doing them in backyards, and then also even before Church Day at day, I was booking shows up in Lancaster. Uh, I moved up there for a short period of time, and I I just decided, you know, so my friend told me once I was complaining about it, saying, "Hey, man, this shit sucks." He says, "Well, you're a smart guy. If you think you could do a better job, why don't you?" So I did. I was like, all right, I'll start doing my own stuff. Just, uh, you know, and what a promoter does basically is it's, I see it as being a curator of art. Um, you're taking, you're taking bands, you're finding, you're finding a venue, making sure that they're going to, you know, let you do the show. Then you get the bands together. Then back then, you know, you'd print up a bunch of flyers, go to other shows or, you know, go to high schools, find the young metalheads, uh, skaters, stuff like that, you know, uh, uh, skateboard shops, malls, like all kinds of crazy things just to promote things and um, tape trading kind of stuff like that, you know, sending flyers out to people and saying, hey, can you pass these out? And, you know, and obviously the show, I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it, but that would be like four or five hours worth of talking. But then, you know, just the night of the show, making sure everything happens and, you know, um, (laughs) hopefully nothing goes wrong. And there's somebody who gets too drunk and ends up fighting, and then you have to deal with that. And then, or they break all the sinks in the bathroom, and you know, I have to pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> like, no venue's just like, hey, that's cool. Yeah, we, we have no more sinks left. It's like, no, you got to replace all that stuff. So it's it comes down to accountability mostly. Like you're basically a promoter is the accountable person for an entire event. Right. You know, it's it's interesting. I want to touch back on what you were saying about like doing that road work, uh, method of promotion, right. Is that I feel, I feel like so much of that has been lost because you know, I'm, I'm in my early mid thirties I'm 33. And I remember like catching the tail end of that when I was like first doing bands, when I was like 13, 14 is doing those, like, 
going to schools and posting up flyers and, you know, hitting up all the music stores and the, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I feel like there is still a lot of merit to be found in that method of promotion that I feel has kind of been like mostly wholly abandoned with the, with the rise of social media. Right. Is it's just like, yeah, people will, you know, they'll, they'll send you the Facebook event invite and they'll, you know, post about it, you know, do what they can to, win the favor of the algorithm gods and seo and all that kind of stuff but i feel i feel like there's still you know a a a need like if you paired that with the traditional method of like street teaming it and just like going out and passing shit out and talking to people i feel like that still that human connection still has has some value and i would i would love to see that kind of make a a comeback in in today's modern world of putting on shows and promotion and all that kind of stuff yeah, there was a, there was actually a funny story when I was in high school. There was this guy, um, God, I can't remember his name, but I think we called him Metal Dave or whatever. But he was a he was a street team coordinator for Golden Boys. Yeah, he would give us stacks of flyers, and that's where I got my flyering tenacity from. Because when I do flyer, like I'm like one of the most like I, I connect with people when I give them a flyer. Yes, the way, mm-hmm. and I'm, and I'll just be like, hey. I'm like, here, scratch paper, write someone's phone number on the back. Here, free acid tags. Yeah. <laughs> like, or I'll notice people's shirts. I'll be like, like, I'll see somebody with like a, you know, let's say a Mayhem shirt. And then I'm just like, hey, Vatane is, is going to be, we got Vatane coming up, you know? And they'd be like, oh, cool. Right on, dude. Yeah, you know, like, you know. So there was an art to it. There was a, a supreme, like, the best street teamers, they're, they're actually like very personable to people. And, and, you know, and I still do flyers. Like I did them a lot. To, uh, to be honest, when uh, Complex was up and running, I had flyers for every single show. And then I still I designed all my own flyers. I did everything. You know, because ad mats weren't a thing back then. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, you know, yeah. then nowadays you get an ad mat and it's real easy. You just plug in your information. It's all done for you. But back then it was like a lot of trips to Kinkos. Yeah. Lot of cutting and pasting and. But you had a you got real like involved in it. And you, it became your life, like spending three hours at Kinkos and then trying to figure out how you could dupe them and say, "I only made ten copies." They're like, "Well, what's that box like?" <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. Like, uh, most loose, just some stuff, you know. There's a puppy in there. You know? This copy machine is confusing, man. It took me a while to figure it out. But <laughs> I, I think I think there's a there's a love for it because in the digital world, there's still a love of analog. And, and analog, you know, is like coming back when you look at like things like how tapes and stuff are selling really well or LPs are selling really well. I think there's still a collectible thing. I mean, my, my entire room was covered in, in flyers and I still have flyers. And it was just like a thing where you could be sitting in your room and, you know, there was shows like every weekend back there. But you could look at it and be like, man, I remember when I saw a carcass and pitch shifter together. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I saw, oh, I remember when I saw Godflesh play at the Troubadour of like 10 people. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I think that's, that's the thing that harkens back that everyone thinks that everything's just got to be on your phone. And I have no problem with social media, whatever. It is what it is. I'm not an old cantankerous bastard who's like, all right, give me back my lawn, you know. But <laughs> I do believe that, yeah, there is, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of value to that. And it's not even so much as promoting the show, but it's coming face to face with your audience and creating that they know who you are. I think if they know who you are, then they'll be less apt to break that sink. Yeah. And it's, it's, that says a lot to another thing is that it's like, man, if I, I, you know, despite being a person who's on stage a lot, like I am a relatively socially anxious person. I feel like a lot of people who choose metal as their, preferred genre are generally you know less less than socially uh you know acclimated at least at first right and so i feel like when you hand a flyer to someone you're like yo come to this show like it encourages them in a way that an online invite doesn't right because they know from that interaction like oh this guy's gonna be at that show like this guy that i talked to and like this this cool metalhead who like complimented me on my mayhem shirt is going to be there. So like, I'm not just going into it blind and alone type of thing. And I feel like that, yeah. that, that is a special thing. It, like it means something. Um, and uh, yeah, I would, I would, you know, even to this day, it, I, I was about to say, I would love to see that come back. But the thing is, is that it's like, I'll, I'll show up to shows sometimes while we're on tour and 
you know, go walk down the street to go get a cup of coffee at some place that I pulled up on Google Maps. And, like, sometimes it's like you see a flyer on, like, a signpost, like, for the show that's happening that night. Yeah. And that shit's a good feeling, man. Like, it, it shows me as an artist that, like, the promoter cares enough to, like, push the show. And, like, that, again, is just, like, it's, like, a special thing. And I uh, I, I think that yeah. it's, it's cool to, to see it, you know. Well, yeah, when it you, happens, you know, I just you, would love to see more of it. <laughs> yeah, you know how it is being a road dog right now. When I was road dogging out there with Crematorium, we were when we would show up to shows, and we would see yeah that flyer on the you know our, our name on the marquee was cool. You know, um, it would always piss me off when they spelled it wrong. I'd be like, how do you spell Crematorium wrong? Dog, oh. try being in a legion. Oh my. Oh God. yeah, no, believe me. <laughs> I know it as a league eon now. That's. Yep. It was like the first time I booked you guys, I was kind of like, how the fuck do you spell this? And then after I kind of like, then I got just used to it. But it's not as bad as this band, which I manage in Los Angeles, called McCott McCootley. Uh, what? And, and <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I think I'm the only person who knows how to spell their name, but yeah, it's McCott. Well, it's, it's pronounced McCott McCootley. Okay. It's like they're, they're an Aztec black metal band. That's fucking sick. So, yeah, it's... um. But yeah, when, you, when you're walking around, because, you know, you you, you got to get there for load-in. And I'm the kind of person, like, I get real fucking anxious, like, if we're not there on time. Like, I don't like being late. Like, I hate it, especially because you have merch to set up and everything. And, you know, and but but we would get there, like, our load-in would be 5 p.m. And we would show up at 1, and it's just like, okay, let's walk around. And then if I would see things, like, a, the local record store would have a, a post, you know, a poster or a flyer up, or I'd see it on the telephone pole or... I was like, man, okay, all right, this is cool, you know, like, I feel welcome, you know, like, and that's what I always wanted to do, I wanted bands to feel welcomed, I wanted them to show up and be like, know that, you know, hey, yeah, I care, I care, the only reason I'm a promoter is because I love music, I don't, don't do it for anything else, I've always had a day job, I said this before in other interviews, I have a day job, I've always had a day job, Yes, there's money to be made out of promoting, but if you're doing it the right way, you're not going to make enough money to, sur to survive because yeah. you're not reinvesting that money into anything. Yeah. Well, so speaking of making bands feel welcome and doing stuff for the bands, uh, I think the thing that a lot of people, you know, who know you, what they what they know you for is that, you know, and you kind of mentioned this earlier when you were talking about, you know, how you got started is that you, when you came along, you kind of broke la out of the like pay to play uh thing um yeah. you know you, you i feel like you kind of facilitated that process tell us a little bit more about that and like why that was important to you i just uh, like yeah i did touch on that a little bit earlier and i have no problems with the with the people you know uh you know at the whiskey and all that stuff i mean they're friends of mine like yeah. you know, I've, I've, no, I've known i've known the uh, mike maglieri Junior, since he was, I've actually played Crematorium played his first show he ever did, and we sold tickets to play it. Nice. And he was he was friends with our old drummer's uh, brother, and you know, so I have no problems with it. I know that I know that that's a hard market to book. The you know the the Red Light District or Sunset Strip is fucking expensive. There's a lot of to go. You know the security and all that stuff. It's L.A. County, but to me, I was just kind of like, there's a whole other there's an underground first of all that can't even get into those clubs and the, and you know when i started doing shows in you know after the backyards i started booking in north hollywood i started wor wor uh, working with this fledgling scene called metalcore and deathcore and also you know old school other old school bands as well and i didn't feel like you know it was made sense to make bands sell tickets i did do it a little bit in the beginning but it was not like you're selling 100 tickets like, I, can, can you sell 10 tickets? Help me pay the touring man, and that's it. And they would come back to me and be like, dude, we couldn't sell the tickets. And they would hand me the, like, it was like maybe $10 a ticket. They hand me a $100 bill. I was like, how many did you actually really sell? Yeah. Sold two. Just give me the 20 bucks. Give me the other tickets back and leave. After a while, I was like, that's more work than it's worth. Like, I just told bands after a while, like, hey, you know, just promote. Care about the shows as much as I do. And it was just like an ethical thing to me. I was like, I'm trying to build a scene instead of, instead of ride the coattails of what was popular. Right. So 
that's why it was it was real important to me to just kind of like break that mold and not do it the way that Hollywood was doing it because I wasn't in Hollywood. I'm not a Hollywood guy. I'm, I'm from Northeast Los Angeles. <laughs> that's how we do shit. Like yeah. we we get down and party, and that's about it. But yeah, there's just again, like I said, you know, this the pre-sale thing to me was just kind of like, and I did it for many years. And and my band, we we always sold way more. Like they'd give us fifty tickets, we we would ask for three times more. We'd be like, give us one hundred and fifty, we'll sell them all for you, yeah. because we wanted our fans to get the tickets for cheaper. But yeah, it's just I don't know. It's just it's just like you know, I didn't find it very ethical for myself, and it was something that I dropped a long time ago, and I never have gone back. Well, it speaks it speaks a lot to being like not only an ethical person in, you know, the music industry, uh, but it speaks a lot to like your DIY sensibilities, you know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously that's a skill set that takes some sharpening and some some honing and crafting. What what advice might you be able to give about, you know, stepping up and like making things happen? Uh if it's like if you see it if you see something you don't like what would you do to change it yeah i think it's just that you know i've always said that i'm not i'm not the world's smartest man <laughs> you know like i i just i'm a jack uh, what is that a uh, jack of all trades master of none kind yeah. of <laughs> i think it's like anybody could change things if they want to get involved and they want to put some passion into it i mean you know you see it a lot i watch a lot of cooking shows and, you, and they always talk about passion yeah. like passion for food Working in a kitchen is one of the hardest environments to work in. I mean, it's, it's hot, it's sweaty. You're cooking food for other people. You're not able to eat it. So you're not able to, it's almost like being a promoter. You can put into, putting together a show. And that was kind of hard for me in the beginning, being a band guy and then putting together these awesome shows and be like, fuck, this is fucking rad, dude. Like there's like 500 people here. And then my own band would play, there'd be 10. I'd be like, fuck, <laughs> sucks. But I, it's, you know, I think that it's just, you need to, if you see something to reevaluate it and just, just like be like, well, how can I make this better? And how can I, you know, no matter what it is, like there's people who, there's so many people taking, for, uh, you know, for, you know, going out and doing photography for shows or videos for shows and all that stuff nowadays. And that was, a, that's like, somebody was like, well, I can't be in a band. I don't know how to play guitar, but I have an eye for photography. Or, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a you know, a, a great, uh, singer classically. So I'll start screaming, you know? And I think that's the thing is that if you want to get involved in things, just, just find the niche to do it and then do it the right way. Just, you know, be like, well, what don't I like? How can I change it? And how do I, you know, facilitate a plan and just go with it. I mean, you know, especially, you know, after the past couple of days, you only live once. You, yeah. You, do it now. Why wait? I mean, waiting for tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. Just do it now. Like, yeah. let's go, run. Yeah. <laughs> like, absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, it's it's important. You know what I mean? Having having even even a little bit of of forethought or like logistical savvy goes such a long way because it's like yeah. you, you don't have to have a perfect game plan to start. Nope. You know what I mean? You just have to have something and then like no you know think about what might happen within that framework and how you're going to respond to it and then just do it you know what i mean like it's yeah. it's hard it's hard work and it's 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 definitely daunting but oftentimes it's like the most rewarding end result um, yeah well success yeah. is built by failure absolutely. absolutely absolutely i mean just like the other the other uh saying that i always liked from uh that was stress builds character like, you know, mm -hmm. there, there also is a thing in like, you know, in the recovery community is, um, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, it, your actions are not what you do in front of others, but what you do behind behind the scenes. Yeah, like, absolutely. That that's like a thing. Like it's like when you see a bunch of trash on the floor and you pick it up and put it in the, in the bin. That's a feeling that you get where yeah. you walk and, you, and you're a superhero to yourself. And then somebody else sees you doing that, and then they're like, "Well, fuck, man, that's that's cool." Then they see a piece of trash. So you clean up your you clean up your own street, yeah. and that's what I did. I saw some trash lying around and said, "Fuck this shit," <laughs> pick this stuff up and and make things better on my block, and then it'll hopefully trickle down. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's a good way to do it, man. You know that there's that. It's been a, a 
a litmus test floating around for uh, the past few months online, the shopping cart test, where it's like, yeah. do you, when, when you're done, do you just leave your shopping cart there? Or do you, like, walk it back to the fucking cart thing? Like, it's not a huge thing, but it speaks volumes to, like, what kind of person you are. Oh, um, yeah, and that... Believe me, I, I have a, I have a, I have a bum knee that slips out all. I like my ACL got completely destroyed at a broken hope pit in San Francisco, and I don't have an ACL anymore. So my knee. Yikes. And also, I'm a, I'm a fairly large dude, so but I always walk my my cart back. Always. Oh, it's just... because, <laughs> because it's not so much it's respect for the person that's coming next, and it's also respect for the person who has to go and get them damn carts. Yep. Yep. And that's see, and that's I feel like that's the the other side of the mentality, right? Is they're just like, well, someone's getting paid to go collect these carts. I might as well just leave it here. And I'm like, yeah, but that's a shitty job. Like that's like, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. So what, I, you know, make someone it, with a shitty jobs life harder. Like that's, yeah. you know, no one wants to it's, be the cart guy collecting guy. Like, you know, that's, it's not like that's just the one thing they do either. You know what I mean? It's not like, Oh, well they, they applied to be the cart collector. It's like, nah, dude, like they work a whole ass shift. And then like, sometimes they get stuck with the, Oh, you got to go collect all the carts shit. So it's like, why, why make that person's life harder when I can take 10 seconds to just walk the cart back type of stuff? Exactly. I mean, like why you don't go over to someone's house and just take a piss in their corner. Yeah. <laughs> you walk to the bathroom and, yeah. and, 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 and if you, if you're, a, if you're a man, you, you, you lift that toilet seat <laughs> There where you take some take some toilet paper and wipe it down. That's, That's right. right. And, 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 and I think it's in Germany or most of Europe. Men sit down when they pee, and yeah. people, are like, why why would you do that? And they say it's out of respect for our mothers because the mothers would have to clean the toilet. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was like, I was like, man, that's probably the deepest thing that I've heard that has to do with pee pee. Yeah, right. God, don't <laughs> don't leave the don't leave the toilet dirty. A, a philosophy to live by. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so so getting back to some LA stuff. Well, I, I feel like actually before we move forward, you did touch on something that I feel like we should talk about uh, that has happened over the past couple days about life being fleeting. Uh, obviously, the metal scene lost a few very important people, members of Metal Church, Slipknot, and ZZ Top, all over the past couple days. Uh, very, very sad stuff, uh, especially yeah. in the case of Joey Jordison, who was way too young. Um, he's the see. He's the sees. He is. I think he's three months younger than I am. Wow. Forty six. Yeah, forty six. When I saw that, you know, I had a I had a hell scare earlier this year. Yeah. I, and and it, I've seen it in a lot of the just in the underground scene too. A lot of, a lot of people passing, recently, and you know, the it's just it, it reminds me of the whole thing of, yeah, you know, why wait with things? I mean, it's sad when when you see these people go and, you know, they've 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 had you know they had so much success and they've they've uh, you know. I know, you know, there's, there's a, it's, it, oh, I will say it real quick to people on social media. If you didn't like somebody when they pass away, I'm getting so tired of seeing people shit talk. Yeah, dude, that edgelord shit is just like, bro, fucking save it. Like, yeah. Like, you know what? I, 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 I don't even respond to these people anymore. I'm just yeah. like, them, that's cool. Don't say anything. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 100%. I don't. I don't care. It's like Slipknot was. You know, I was already in death metal bands and brutal death metal bands and everything like that. But a lot of people don't realize that that Slipknot, the scene was dying. It was oh, yeah. fucking dead. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Napalm Death and Carcass and play at the Hollywood Palladium and sell it out. And then the next time I saw Carcass, they couldn't even pack the whiskey. Yeah. Now for people that don't know, the the Hollywood Palladium holds like five thousand people. And the whiskey holds 400. Mm -hmm. And this was, it's that bands like Slipknot brought a whole new generation of metalheads. And people were like, well, yeah, they're not this and they're not that. It's like, first of all, the first Slipknot demo was a fucking death metal record. Yeah. yeah. Second of all, Joey played an anal blast. Yeah. So it's like, it's like they cut their teeth in the scene and they found a way to do something. And yeah, there's the whole thing. Well, who did it first, Mushroom Head or Slipknot and all yeah, that? But Mm -hmm. Mushroom had always had that electronic element, and what Slipknot did, and you know, sorry to in interrupt, but oh, no. what Slipknot did, which was groundbreaking and pioneering, and is what really brought them into that focal point of popularity, is that they took new metal and put fucking death metal drums on it, and like they did. that is 
all Joey Jordison. <laughs> like that is all. That was Joey. Joey. Yeah, he, they... he wrote most of their first album, like all the songs, and he brought that element to something. He took an element of something that he loved that was dying and brought it into something that was popular. And like, you, like not a whole lot of people come around per generation that do something like that. And like, it's you know. I feel like even if you didn't listen to Slipknot, you know what I mean? Even if you were, like you said, like already balls deep in the brutal death metal scene and Slipknot was like too vanilla for you, like there's there's a level of respect that like has to be shown for the the innovation and the pioneering moves that he did and like the result of what happened. Because now it's like, man, most of my social media feed, especially people like right around my age and a little bit younger, it's like Slipknot and Joey was like their first introduction to like it was double kicks and crazy drum solos and like really heavy aggressive music that like broke past that boundary of like your metallicas and your megadeths and stuff like that yeah and, uh you know i i know for a fact that without you know their influence so many metal bands and metal musicians just wouldn't exist the way they do today no um, they wouldn't and they, you know i i plus they put on a fucking great live show oh yeah I mean, it was a whole immersive experience. It was, it was the first time I ever saw Slipknot Live. My friend got tickets. We went and seen him at the Palladium. Um, they uh, they opened up, you know, and I was just like, this is fucking awesome. You know, I wasn't really too into the CD. I was like, oh, whatever. Saw him live. I'm like, okay, these guys are cool. Yeah. Next time I saw him was at the Tattoo of the Earth uh, tour. And I, I went to see Hatebreed because I was, a, this was like, they toured on that first record for like 7,000 years. Yeah. And, and I mean, I've seen Hatebreed so many damn times. I have a, I have a tour shirt from 96 that I still have. That's way too small for me. But um, like I went to see, I went to see them and I saw Slipknot once again, and they had all the older metal heads. They had Slayer opening for Slipknot. And people were like, why is Slayer playing before Slipknot? That's Slayer. Slayer wasn't doing that great at that point. Right. Warren, I'm telling you, the scene was fucking dying. Mm -hmm. And disrespect the Slayer because they're one of the, the, you know, the top five. But I'm just like, I went and saw them, and I saw all these people, and then I started seeing it trickle down into the my own shows. I started seeing Slipknot shirts, at, you know, because the uh, the new metal scene was 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 blowing up. And why just bringing back the flyer thing? We would take our flyers and demos and pass them out at those things. Yeah, it, it, these are fledgling. I don't care who the who the hell anybody is. When you were born, you didn't come out wearing a Cannibal Corpse shirt. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, you sure. listen, you yeah. listen to the whatever it was Sesame Street, the Wiggles, or whatever the hell generation you're from. People just sometimes are too elitist in that thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that you know, Joey did a lot. He had a lot of work that he did in the scene, and it just it, it was it was sad when I saw it. And like I said, it touched to me because we were the same age, and I'm just like, fuck, man. And then I look at it and say, you know, I was in a in a side project band where two of the members have already passed away, and I'm only 46, and I'm just like, Jesus, man. And it, again, that's why I, I'll say it one more time. I like to reiterate points to people: live your life. Yep. Every day is your last because you could go in your sleep, man. Yeah. From I have my friend uh, Greg from Sacrificer. He died from an asthma attack. And, you know, and it's just like, but the pub was partying with this guy like six months ago. And then all of a sudden they're just like, he, he passed away. And I'm like, what? He was, you know, one of, one of my young little meatballs. Yeah. It's like, fuck, what the hell? So yeah, get out there and do it. And much respect and, you know, rest in peace to the three guys that just passed away and their families and everything. And again, if you got something negative to say on social media, then when one of your family members pass away, I hope somebody pisses on your parade. Yeah, right. Fucking seriously. And, and, you know, it goes back to what you said right at the beginning, man. You know, thankful to wake up and take a breath of fresh air every day. Yep. Um, well, so so getting back getting back on track, because I don't want don't to lose focus on the guy I'm interviewing here. Uh, so <laughs> what, is, what is the latest on uh, L.A. venues? I know that a lot of venues have experienced closures, uh, you know, one of which was, was the Hi-Hat, that we actually worked together on a show. Yes. Uh, late 2019, that venue's gone now um you know what 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 are you looking at as far as like how you see kind of the rest of the year next year looking like for shows so we have um an upcoming show my first show back really is the i 
actually did a we did a memorial for another friend who passed away at this uh, this venue called Bricks. But my first show back as a promoter is this Deicide and Cataclysm show that's coming up. Right. And um, it's sold out in advance. So we at first, you know, the whole thing was is we're full reopen. And then now it's there's a mask mandate. And we're still waiting to see if it's only the crowd or what's the vaccine. And it's it changes every single day. Yeah. And I mean, I got my I got my vaccine. I you know, people could be anti vax or this or that. That's their own that's their own cheese man. Like whatever you want to do, but I really don't know. I mean, yeah, we lost the hi hat, which was a great little venue because that was I was born two blocks down the street from that place. You know, we're not born, but I was that was the first place I was brought back to after I was born up the street in the hospital. But I wasn't born on the streets, even though some people might think that. <laughs> but uh, you know, then there was like I, you know, so some of the venues have come back. Seventeen twenty is still going to be there. Um, they they've pushed through. Uh, the region, the Echo, the Echo Plex, you know, they were able to push through, but that was because they're a Live Nation kind of thing right now. Um, Catch One is pushing through. The, you know, there it's an independent venue, but, you know, luckily they own the land. Um, some of the other small ones, like the Lexington, which is a small little place for up-and-coming bands to play at, they were bought and sold and then reprogrammed. The Five Star Bar uh, is basically not going to be a live venue anymore so much of the you know and it's like teragram ballroom is coming back the moroccan's coming back and there's a few weirdly enough some venues that are going to open up it's just going to be kind of like how it was in the 90s where there was a flux where venues got wiped out and then venues come back right but the the thing right now is, is is how we could operate because you could socially distance and everything, but I'm always worried about <laughs> to take it back to the bathroom is the bathrooms. How the hell? Because, you know, how do you socially distance in a bathroom? <laughs> you know, like, how is, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, you know, at this point, and you know, um, rest in peace to everyone who passed away from the COVID-19 virus. You know, this is, it's sad. Whether you, whether you believe it's a hoax or not, people did die. And you need to always have respect for people who pass away. Again, have respect for the families and and the people who passed away. Absolutely. I don't know how it's going to go until August 14th. Yeah. (laughs) Honest with you. Yeah. Hey man, I I feel you. I feel you on that. There's, there's a couple things on, on our books that we're looking at and we're just like, just wait and see. We're in, you know, hurry up and wait is, is is the name of the game right now is it's just like, you know, we'll, we'll see what venues where cause every that's, whole thing is it's just like man every state's different you know what i mean like yeah california reopened on june 15th for the most part but like what's it gonna be like in oregon what's it gonna be like in washington you know what's it gonna be like in all these other states uh you know that we have to go to um yeah you can't just tour through florida and texas yeah right it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be weird man and you know obviously you know i'm, I'm fully vaxxed i had covid late last year oh. um it was uh that sucked definitely definitely a real thing uh i still i still smell and taste things in a way that i don't like uh, <laughs> wow but uh but yeah how you, you know, up, how are you holding up as a vocalist with having uh, dude it, it 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 was a it was a steep climb back especially because it's like we just recorded a record in uh in april may and like you know it, i i sing every day um you know, I, I make sure that my voice is good. I, I do, you know, classical warm ups all the way from just like low volume, m- low range type of stuff to like full belting, screaming every single day. And I think that that helped a lot when it came down to studio time. But even with all that intact, like, I found that my voice had changed in a way that like I had to accommodate that physical change with like how I approach my singing style. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's still mostly the same you know what i mean it's like my voice says i I managed to to find workarounds that kept my style intact but at the same time it was like those workarounds needed to be made because if i tried to do what i usually did to convey the same emotion or the same range uh 
it just wasn't working and like i could feel the strain in my voice and i was just like yeah man i can't i can't be trying to fucking square peg round hole this shit otherwise i'm gonna get vocal polyps and it's just gonna be bad yeah. news so yeah that's yeah, a big thing yeah because i i was um i was actually uh when i was a, a kid i used to get uh vocal polyps as as like a thing that happened like just i was born with that gene in me right when i as a death metal singer i when i had i had to have my tonsils and uh, uvula removed like i have nothing and I, I had to have surgery and i was so worried about that changing my voice yeah but, i mean it's good that you i mean you have to adapt and overcome yeah that's basically what, what you're doing which is good to hear because yeah i've had a few friends who actually had it and they it changed it changed their life i mean some people say yeah i got it and it was no big deal i was like okay cool <laughs> Bro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate that like the the sickness part of it didn't hit me super hard. You know, it did just feel like a shitty flu for a few days. But man, some of these long haul symptoms, dude, they're no fucking jokes. Like I, yeah. it's like I said, like a, a lot of the smells and particularly like my, that that olfactory nerve is fucked. <laughs> it's like 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 uh like mint, garlic, car exhaust, fresh cut grass, uh, literal shit. They all smell the same. Um, oh wow! They, yeah, they've all translated into the same weird. It's like a weird, like hot dog food kind of smell. Coffee is another one. It's fucking Ooh. horrible. It's fu- <laughs> it's like I'll be driving in the car with my wife and be like, "Hey, what do you smell right now?" And she'll be like, "Oh, I smell car exhaust. Or, oh, it smells like someone's landscaping or like oh, some of that shit." And I'm just like, "Oh well, I'm smelling the smell." You know, I've I've had to like change toothpaste from mint to like cinnamon because when I go to brush my teeth with like a minty toothpaste, I'm like, it tastes like literal dog shit. Like, <laughs> well, I, I, I hope, I hope you're uh, I hope you're not Sicilian or Italian because without being able to smell garlic, dude, I would... it's rough, man. I'm, mind. I'm, I'm definitely a, a kitchen, kitchen savvy type of guy. And oh. like, bro, when I'm like sitting there, like, you know, putting some onions and some oil is like, you know, the first step of cooking something. I'm just like, this is terrible. This used to be like one of my favorite smells and now I'm just that like, is the Ugh. best no like when Ugh. you first like, when you first start something cooking yeah throw a little bit of onions some garlic a little bit of salt oh. and some olive oil it's like it's just that aroma is just like it's it's such a good feeling and now I'm just like oh this is rough to get through but yeah man long haul symptoms on it probably suck more than the actual uh the oh, actual experience man. of having it <laughs> but baby uh, boy i feel for you well but i'm glad though i'm glad that the vaxes are out and i'm glad that a lot of people are getting it and that we're we're you know kind of seeing like a return to normalcy it's um, and it's easy to get i will tell people like i know i know we have other things to go through but this is a big thing that has to do with shows is, is you know people people getting getting things and everything so i i took my mom to get hers at kaiser and then walked up and I said, "Can I get mine here?" And they're like, "Yep, no payment, yep, no nothing." Yeah, I did grow a third arm though, and it's a transformer arm. Yeah, <laughs> Who cares. I mean, people are like, "Yeah, I'm feeling," you know, you don't want to become blah blah blah. I was like, Psh. "Yeah, really." Like, I, I like the whole thing where it says like. You won't get the vaccine, but you're doing cocaine off, off the bathroom. Yeah, and you know, like, what? for me, it's like, dog, like now I have a piece of paper that says that I can fucking go to shows and get on airplanes and like do all this shit and like if all that happens from that is like oh i feel kind of shitty for a couple days and my arm hurts and i have a headache like who cares like yeah. well like, and a lot of people people don't realize like if, if you travel to like when i went to egypt you don't just walk into do you have to no. get means to travel places like it's like, why do we feel so self-important in America that we have to be like, anchor, tell me what to do, God damn it. But yeah. when it's red, you stop, don't you, stupid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like I said, I'm just glad that things are kind of starting to get back to normal and that shows are starting to come back. And, you know, yeah. while, while we are still in the hurry up and wait kind of period, like, I'm glad that that light at the end of the tunnel is as soon as, like, August 14th. You know what I mean? Like, yes. just a couple weeks away. You know, we'll be able to kind of have some metrics to work with and like see how yeah. things go and you know it's it's exciting after this long away it's uh it's very exciting to start coming back but uh, so you know as things are coming back and as someone who has their finger on the pulse with the la metal scene and you know which is you know i feel like can be representative of a lot of other different metal scenes uh you know yeah. la kind okay. of sets sets the tempo for a lot of places in the surrounding area what what do you think the average metalhead can do right now to support the scene as it's kind of coming back? Well, 
One of them is, and I know a lot of people are going to hate it, but get that vaccine. If you don't have the vaccine, put a mask on your face. Yeah. Tell you what, we all look prettier with masks. Yeah. I tell you what, like the eyes are the gateway to the soul That's and right. teeth or whatever, man. Yeah. Like, I love, I love, I actually have a thing for women with crooked teeth. Yeah. It's been that way. Same. Like odd teeth. I've always liked it, but you know, play, play, play by the rules, you know, like just so, so we could, so we could get things going again. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a very small ask to do. You don't want to get the vaccine. That's cool. Just play by the rules. Don't be stupid. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, the thing is like right now is like, until shows, you know, come back, support the bands that you love when they when they put stuff out and they have merch out and stuff like that, pick it up, you know, take some of that stimmy, you know, that, <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, feed it to the bands because bands got to eat. And then it's yeah. not making, you know, being on tour is not like you're coming home. You're like, yeah, what's up with that Porsche 911, babe? <laughs> you're, you're like, well, let me make my car payment on my Toyota. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, proud, proud <laughs> right. Camry owner right here. That's <laughs> Toyotas will last forever. That's for sure. Like it, you know, it's just like it, just be proactive and stuff, and, and and being aware and follow follow the mandates. And if you show up to a show like you know, like I said on August fourteenth for me, and we're asking people to do something, just do it. Yeah, just don't argue with me. Yeah. I'm so tired of people arguing with me. Like they're what i'm not special you're not special we're all specks of dust in this worldwide yeah. <laughs> just, just do whatever the fuck it says so we can have the goddamn show it, it, yeah. it be that guy you know what you'll be that guy sitting outside because i'm not gonna fuck with people yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit there and, and ruin it for everybody else yeah. that's why i hate exactly. people cut in line i always do that when people cut in line I, I go, hey, so what you're doing right now is telling telling everybody else in line that you're better than them. So what I want you to do is I'll let you in, but you have to go tell 15 people that you're better than them. Yeah. <laughs> watch you do it. Well, why am I going to do that, dog? That's stupid. I said, no, it's not. That's what I want you to do. Like, I don't care. I'm too old at this point to do these fucking shenanigans. Like, no, 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 not at all. Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, well, I want to see the first band. I was like, all right, well, who's the first band? Oh. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. Uh, I fucking love it, man. I fucking love it. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's such a good move. I wish I could be a fly on the wall to some dude who cut in line being like, hey, person behind me, I'm better than you. Like, how often has that ended in that dude just getting fucking Oh, no, it, 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 like... it, 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 most of the time, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I actually did I went to see Depeche Mode play and, and, and it was like a it was a, a like a Jimmy Kimmel thing and, and somebody cut in front of a bunch of people and, and people were too scared to say something and I was like oh hell no man yeah. went up there snapping the wagon and all kinds of stuff and I said so you're better than me yeah. you're better than her you're better than them well this is my favorite band I said we're all here to see him dummy yeah <laughs> like we're just getting along. I want to make sure I get in. I was like, my you got here late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, man, that was a, then her, then her friend was like sitting there, the guy, the guy, the guy that she was with, I was like, all right, so you know, the rules of dudes is, is that I can't hit her. So I'm going to have to beat you up. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and I'm not going to, I'm not a, I'm not a tough guy. I'm a, I'm a yeah. petty bear, but I'm like sitting there like, all right, so we're going to have to fight. And then he's like, you better control her. And, yeah. It was, <laughs> not saying that women should be controlled at all women do women are the mothers of, of this of this planet but it's when you snap back at me i'm gonna snap back at you i don't oh care. yeah oh yeah 100 percent. nikki is nikki is loving uh this by the way our our for those of you watching nikki is our our uh eye in the sky so to speak who watches all of our our stuff and she's just loving this she has she's she told me uh you know ask ask dan his feeling on comps he gets blown up dave shows all the time like hey can you get me in bro <laughs> oh god it is uh, it is the it is the worst like you know i mean there's people that are forever guest listed you know people who helped me out people yeah yeah man there's those people who are like yo dude what's up man how you been on the day of the show and i'm like man fuck off you don't care yeah right like of i course. was i was like what's you know just yep. looking for something to do where you don't have to spend money get out of my face oh yeah i remember <laughs> one of a uh, uh metal blade employees stephanie shoulders she um we actually i think the first time we met was uh there was this 
girl Jessica Tolliver that work at Century Media with with Stephanie and I yeah. at the time when we were all at set, and and I was at the Knitting Factory in Hollywood, and they showed up and Je- and Jessica was like, "Yo, what's up? Can you get me on?" My man, fuck off. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> that was her first memory of me. Uh, it's kind of I'm just like, man, bring me a box of CDs. That's all I care. You know, if if you're from a label, bring me some, bring me some swag, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, the, I I I don't even answer my phone anymore on the on the day of the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially now with shows coming back and everybody like coming back from a a, a negative boon, right? Like. Oh, we actually, I am, I said, I said no guest list. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are doing that, man. A lot of people, are, a lot of bands, it's, it's kind of like an unspoken rule right now is it's just like, dude, I, I know we're tight. I know we've like toured together and I know that we're homies, but like, do not ask for guest lists, at least for the first like year of shows returning because like yeah. ev- every penny counts, like especially right now. So yeah, so much, so much back rent, so much stuff. You know, the bands get back end off of that. Guarantees have to be paid. Staff has to be paid. Staff at venues hasn't worked in a year. You know, like most of these people have been on. People are like, well, they're just kicking it at home, making unemployment insurance. No, no, no band member. No, no, you know, uh, the front of house engineer. No, anybody wanted to be at home. No. Uh, well, we work this life. This is our life. This is yeah. what we we eat, breathe, and shit. Like, yeah. want this? We we're not just sitting there like yeah it's cool but I I didn't want it. I didn't want to cancel a whole year's worth of fucking shows and 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 I know you were going to answer ask me this question at some point anyway but my uh, my murder fest I was oh, yeah. you know, I was bringing it back in 2021 I had murder fest 6.66 booked <sighs> so sick and I and I had to I had to cancel it yeah. And now people are like, when are you going to rebook it? I'm like, dude, I don't know, man. Like, we got to wait. Like, yeah. No, honestly, man. I got to fly bands in. Like. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's tough, man. I mean, we did the same, same thing two weeks before we were supposed to go out on a headliner. Just like pull the plug. Had to do it. And it's just like, bro, like, you know, it's it's like you were saying. A lot of, you know, we're not coming back home from tour being like, oh, time to jump in my Lambo and go cruise around the fucking North Shore. But, like, at the same time, like – headlining tour that gets canceled man that's money left on the table and it's fucking it stings it it, It fucking stings and not even talking about everything that's there in shows i mean a lot of a lot of people have to realize that are out there that are not in bands that merchandising oh yeah you print so much stuff when you go on tour you 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 basically look at your tour dates and you try to figure out okay we need this much we need this much we need this much and you pay it all up front so doing is basically I guess you could wear a new T-shirt every year, <laughs> every, <laughs> but I mean, so much stuff happens. I mean, especially if you put dates on the back. Yeah, that's trash. Yeah, what it's, are you gonna it do? Can't be reused, man. I, man, I definitely have some some Euro twenty eighteen T-shirts still just hanging out, man. You, I, I think the best thing to do with those ones is you just like you just bundle them. You're just like, oh, it's like a vintage tee. It's like here you go. It's a part of history. Like have you know you, you yeah. put some kind of creative sales angle on it because. You're right. Once that, once those days come and go, whatever you have left over is just fucking. It's mostly garbage. Um, yep. I want to ask you something though, since you you mentioned you know uh, merch printing and all that stuff, and I know that this is a topic that a lot of people are, are curious about. So you also work at a uh, vinyl pr- pressing plant, precision yes. precision pressing, right? Yep. So let's talk about that for a minute, because I'm I'm always super interested in, in this kind of stuff. I know a lot of our viewers are as well. Vinyl right now is like precious, it's precious gems. Um, you know, yeah, what's, it's a what's hot ticket item with that. And you know, what what insight do you have on on the how and why and what to expect moving forward with vinyl? So with with vinyl, you know, when I first started at Precision Pressing. Um, or precision record pressing, so I give them their little their right hashtag. Um, we were able to turn around a vinyl record in seven to eight weeks. Yeah, we were able to do a rush record in six weeks. Now the whole process is long. You know, I mean, you got to take audio, get it, put it. You know, send out test pressings, have those approved, have art approved, have the have everything pressed and all that. And uh, you know, pressing vinyl is actually a very um, violent way of doing things because you're taking you know a puck basically so this looks like a little hockey puck you put it in a machine 
Two things come down with plates, <clears throat> squashes it together, and it comes out, and it's heated. It's like, I don't know if people ever remember going to the zoo and buying those little, like, wax animals and everything. Like, yeah. It's the easiest way I could, for people who don't understand it, but if you go to, like, the Precision Pressing Instagram or something like that, you they, we actually post a lot of videos on how it's done. But so what happened was is after when COVID started hitting, we had this thing where a lot of bands were sitting at home and writing music. So then they wanted the only thing that they could do to subsidize themselves was release music. So it just kept stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking. And then also getting compounds and, you know, uh, finding paper and all this stuff. It became because people weren't able to work. So it all trickles down. The guy who's the guy who's, you know, cutting down trees is making, you know, it just it trickles actually up, I guess you could say. Right. So now what's happening in the industry right now is that everything's so far pushed back. We're we're turning a twelve inch record in about eighteen sevens and tens are like thirty weeks. Wow. Some there's some plants that are not even able to do anything until twenty twenty two right now. Jeez. And I mean, and, and when you work at a record label, you don't you don't think about today. You think like three, four months in advance. Right. That's how you set up a record. It's a three, four month in advance thing. Well, when I was in Century Media, setting up vinyl was always kind of a thing because you had everything planned four months in advance. You don't know anything yet. You don't know a marketing plan. You don't know if the band's going to tour you this or that. And you have to well, how the pre order is going to go. So it's kind of thrown everything in this weird flux. So everything's just flying around right now and working at a, at a pressing plant uh, going from the side of being an a and r slash product manager at a record label and then going to and this is my day job stuff so i you know going into working at this stuff it's kind of like i have friends that come to me and like yeah i need three thousand records pressed i'm like dude i don't have the capacity for it yeah it's only press a certain amount of records in a day it's not as easy as, as certain things like a CD and all that stuff. You know, it's not, there's manual things, especially when it's, which is the big thing right now, is color variants. Oh, yeah. Adders, A side, B sides, all those beautiful records that you see. Somebody had to manually do that. It's not, it's not just like, it's, it's you know, somebody's basically sitting there and putting a little, they look like little donuts, like little, hand, you know, because they put sprinkles on it and stuff and washes and it makes that stuff. And somebody has to manually do it and we only have Sony machines and everybody wants to keep ordering and we're like, ah, we can't. Yeah. So, a lot of people aren't even taking new business. They're like, screw you. Out of here. Yep. It's tough, man. It it's tough to turn away business. You know, as a, as oh, it a is. small business owner, I'm just like, you know, the, the idea of turning away business is just like, it's the worst case scenario to me. And like, it's good to be so busy that you have to turn away business, but when it's a supply shortage issue, like that sucks. So I, uh, Oh, it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to turn away that's, you know, besides that, I also work with a lot of up and coming bands. Like my department is basically, we work with, I, you know, I have the labels that I work with, but I also work with small independent bands. So we've actually, Precision has a very big ethical, um, like, background where a lot of us were in music and, or, you know, producers or stuff like that. So we've kept our capacity open to still be able to work with independent bands that want, you know, 100 records or 500 records or up to 1,000 or something like that, where we've actually blocked, told a lot of major labels, like, you can't have any more just to make sure that we could still support the smaller guys. Right. But, you know, that even at this point is just kind of like where we're like, damn, how am I going to slot this in? What are we going to do with it? Because my my uh, my boss is very protective of that. He's like, we are the we are the we are the small bands pressing plant. We stand behind them. We will always stand behind them because small bands will will always be what I love. I'm like that's the reason why I loved working for this job because they kind of have the same ethics that I do, and I'm like that's why I, I kind of like slipped in easily doing this kind of thing. I never thought I'd be working on the production end because my mind is more set up for marketing campaigns and you know promotion and stuff like that. Now all of a sudden I'm pressing records, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doing distro all of a sudden. Well, that's that's super interesting. I you know it's 
obviously vinyl is in very high demand right now. You know, yep. I know as someone who's in the middle of putting together an album for release, it's like it's a it's a point of contention for sure. It's like getting yeah. getting pressing and doing all this kind of stuff. So it's it's thank you for providing that insight because it's it's really interesting to me, especially right now with how vinyl is going to hear that kind of stuff man it's uh it's it's, it's definitely uh it's definitely good to know i feel and yeah. even even as a viewer even if you're not preparing to put out a release right now or maybe ever it's good to know uh this kind of stuff just to see you know a little a little bit of a peek behind the curtain and, yep. and what's going on back here so i don't want to keep you too much longer man you've been you've been a, a awesome guest and we've been here for like an hour but i do have a couple last questions for you uh yep. One is a is a double tap. It's food related. Uh, Nikki again wants to know: Are you still making pickles? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two second part to this question: Why has Taco Bell fucked up their menu so much? And what do we need to bring back? What needs to go back on the Taco Bell menu? You know, they just brought back nacho fries. I'm I'm pretty excited about that myself. But yeah, but you know, yeah. My uh, and uh, thanks for asking that question, Nichols. That's my that's my uh, nickname for uh, for Nikki is Nichols. Uh, I'm I'm, gonna, I'm adopting it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's cute. Um, yeah, I love pickles. Yeah, I, I am absolutely in love with pickles. It just pulled anything. I just yeah. love. It. Um, but yeah, I still make my own pickles. I uh, it's a very easy thing to do, and it's kind of cathartic to see to sit there and like watch something you know bloom and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I actually have said that once I finally retire from this life, this, you know, whether it's working in production or working at shows, what I'm going to do is um, retire to the middle of nowhere and have a pickle farm and a cat rescue. Hell yes. Noble so, aspirations right there. Yes. <laughs> and, and then Taco Bell, man, ah, oh, fuck that. You know, I started yeah. <laughs> that thing because they took away the Mexican pizza. Like, how are you going to take away the Mexican pizza, bro? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man oh it's the packaging man shut up it's not the pet they oh we want to get our, our the turn times down you know this and that and then yeah they start taking away more than more of this stuff but the you know the the glory of it all is if you know for people that don't have it sorry but if you go to a del taco del taco oh, yeah gone insane lately and they have they have gr uh, great options for people who are vegetarian and vegan they do now Taco Taco Bell wanted to be is, was actually at one point one of the healthiest fast food places besides Subway, yeah. and been on tour, you know it's Subway or Taco Bell. Yeah, you know, that's what mm -hmm. you're gonna eat all the time. And, man, your guts get wrecked. Yeah, after it's not, a while, it's not a fun time. It's not. <laughs> but I I don't know who the the Taco Bell execs what the hell they're thinking. Like I mean, you just go to Taco Bell now, and it's like almost going to like In and Out, where it's only got in In and Out you have burger, double burger triple burger and then fries yeah. it's a simple menu but taco bell used to be the place you go to when you had the munchies yeah people now stoners go to jack in the box yeah and... i was gonna say jack in the box is the munchie spot now but that's <laughs> oh, bro, yeah they're just they're jack in the box is getting fucking out of pocket with that shit man like they are like i'm like you guys are putting like like mashed potatoes on a chicken sandwich like you guys need to fucking calm down it's not okay oh, yeah. uh, well i mean they even have their their late their late night menu is called the munchie mills yeah yeah uh, they, they know they're like i mean you know jack look weeds it, weeds mostly legal now we're, we're gonna milk this we're gonna <laughs> yeah yeah it's like if two grilled cheese sandwiches with with a with a hamburger with a hamburger and macaroni and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> that sounds like what is that sounds like what a stoner would make. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Fucking Oh my god. Yeah. I was man, this conversation is just making me like hungry and sad. I'm just like, "Oh man, Taco Bell sounds good. Wait, no it doesn't." Uh. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> but uh okay, so and then my one last question I have for you uh, you know, is is the usual interview ending question. Uh, you know, let us know where to follow you, how we can support the local scene in LA, what you're doing, and every everything else you're a part of. Plug plug that shit. All right. So yeah, I mean, we got the Facebook and the Instagram and Twitter. Even I barely use the Twitter stuff, yeah. but we have all that. It's just basically, or you can just just even Google Church of the Eighth Day. Um, the dot com is Church of the Eighth Day dot com, and it's the number eight, not spelled out. Um, we have shows coming up. 
you know, they're all listed there. I'm not going to go through them. There's three of them that are listed right now. The DSI Cataclysm, the Unleash the Archers uh, show in September, and then we got a Skeletal Remains uh, show coming up. And then there's a bunch of other things that we're working on. I'm sure I'll be working with you guys again soon. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, the best way to support is to, one, show up at the shows, and two, follow the rules. Yep. Don't argue with the people that are there. We're just we're trying to get things moving again. If you're there to argue, then you know what? Keep your money in your pocket because you're not going to come in. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'd love to hear it. Love to hear it. Putting that foot down. Well, Dan, yeah. thank you so much, man, for taking the time to talk today. It's been a super fun conversation. I uh, really awesome. enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Of course, as always, we'll be back next week with another guest. Make sure to follow metal blade records across social media to see who that next guest is going to be and uh we'll see you there uh thanks again dan i'm riley mcshane singer for a legion host of this little shindig we have here and i will see you all next week <laughs>